Uh, I'm Tom Kunselman. I teach chemistry here at Spring Arbor University. So welcome everybody. Uh, as you know, we have uh, Professor Catherine Hayhoe here with us tonight. Um, in, in my interest, uh, I'm, I'm involved in science communication locally here, and I have a real interest lately in, in climate science. And so uh, Catherine's work and her videos show up all over my social media timeline. So I'm very familiar with her, and I'm very pleased to have had the opportunity to read her book. Uh, she is a professor at Texas Tech University. She is the chief scientist at the Nature Conservancy. She's been uh, named one of the most effective, uh, the nation's most effective science communicators by the New York Times. She's been uh, mentioned as one of Times most 100 uh, most influential people. And the list goes on and on. So we're very pleased to have her here, here tonight. And I look forward to learning more from her than I already have. So oh. our uh, students here tonight will be asking uh, some questions that they have uh, after they've, they've read her new text or her new book. And so I guess we'll let our students take it away. Thanks for being with us, Professor. Sounds Hill. good. Thank you for having me. All right, who's up first? Hi, my name is Frankie. Um, now my question is how would how would obtaining resources for renewable energy ultimately affect the natural world in your opinion? Oh, okay, that's a great question. So I've sort of heard that question in a couple of different ways just in the last 24 hours. And often there's this misconception that there is a free energy lunch. That either we have the way we get energy today, or there's got to be a way that is totally free in, in terms of there's no impacts whatsoever of any negative kind. And if somebody discovers a negative impact, like, oh my goodness, electric cars have batteries. Oh, who knew? And those batteries require rare earth minerals. No, why did nobody know that? And those minerals are mined out of the earth's crust. And then people are like, oh, well then we can't use electric cars. So this is something that I hear quite a bit. And it's based on the, on the fallacy that there's somehow a free lunch. And I wish there were a free lunch, but there isn't. There is no free lunch when it comes to energy, but yet. But what we have today is we have a very expensive lunch, so to speak, which means depending on fossil fuels, which if we continue to do so, will mean the extinction of over 30% of the plant and animal species on this planet and the destruction of human civilization as we know it. That's choice A. Or choice B, we have a world where we use our energy efficiently, transition to clean energy, electrify everything we can, invest in nature-based solutions. And we still have the issue of rare earth minerals for batteries, but we, first of all, mine responsibly. Second of all, recycle everything we can. And the National Renewable Energy Lab is actually working very, very intensively on figuring out how to recycle batteries. And third, there's other people who are working very hard on developing batteries that don't require rare earth minerals as well. So either we continue on our current pathway or we transition to new sources of energy that are not cost free, but the price is a lot less than the ones we're currently using. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name's uh, Mateo and my question was um, a lot of people can sometimes struggle with like eco anxiety, like uh, anxiety about climate change. And your book helps a lot to quell some of the fears that we have, um, it, like gives hope in a seemingly hopeless situation. So my question was, what are ways that we as students can spread this hope uh, to others? Oh, I love that question. <laughs> that makes me so happy. And honestly, that just gives me hope right there. So, so you're right. Um, across the United States, 70% of people are already worried about climate change. Across 10 countries, 84% of young people are already worried about climate change. And if you're not worried, you should be because it's bad and it is going to get worse and we need to fix it as much as possible, as soon as possible, because what's at stake is, as the title of my book says, it's not the planet, it's us. We're the ones who are at stake. So what is hope? Hope is the chance that there's something better. Hope is the knowledge that if we do something, it can make a difference. 
And where do we find that hope? In acting ourselves and in sharing what we know about what others are doing with others who don't understand how our actions can make a difference. So the most important thing you can do is talk to people and share. And when I say talk, it could be with your voice, it could be posting, it could be writing, it could be um, you know, doing things where other people can see you. But show how many hands there are on that giant boulder rolling it down the hill. And if someone feels like, oh, there's nothing we can do or nothing makes a difference, say, that's not true. Look at what my university is doing. Look at what people are doing in my state. Look at what other young people are doing. Look at what people are doing and here's something that you can do yourself to put your hand on that boulder getting going down that hill. So encourage others, help them practice active hope by showing them what a difference our actions do make and how they themselves can get engaged in action because um, to quote Greta Thunberg, and I didn't put this quote in my book, I think it perfectly sums it up. She said, there's only one thing we need more than hope and that is action, but when we act, hope is all around us. And I think she should know. Hi, um, I'm Ashley Wiedela. Um I just was wondering after writing this book and it being out for a little while, is there something that you wish you would have wrote in there or another point that you wish you would have added that you ended up not putting in there? Oh, okay. You guys are asking the best questions. <laughs> yes, there always is, right? So um, a couple of things. First of all, after I finished writing the book, I participated in an experiment with researchers at Yale University where we tested out whether my approach, whether beginning with shared values, connecting the dots to climate change and bringing up positive constructive solutions people can get on board with, the approach I talk in my book, about my book, I te we tested whether it worked on mass. So not just in individual conversations, not just in you know give, me giving a talk or a presentation, we tested whether it works on social media in real life. So we made four super short videos, like I'm talking one minute, one and a half minute videos. And they were all videos that began with a value that many Republicans would share. So one, one video was about free market solutions to climate change. Another was on libertarian values and personal liberties. Another was by a retired Air Force general talking about climate change as a national security issue. And then I did one of the videos talking about not only the science, but speaking as a person of faith, talking about how Christian values um, relate to climate action. So the Yale researchers aired these four videos on social media and they paid for them to be boosted into people's feeds on Facebook and YouTube in real life in three what you call purple districts. So where there's a lot of Republicans and a lot of Democrats in the same district. And they monitored people's opinions to see what happened when they were exposed to these super short messages in real life. So it turned out that Democrat opinions on climate change, as they saw these videos popping up on social media in their feed, their opinions went up a little bit, single digits. Republican opinions on climate change went up double digits. <laughs> That's <crazy>. Why? <laughs> because they were seeing it framed around values that they shared. And so I really wish I could have put that in the book because I'd be like, look how well this works in real life. And I said to the Yale researchers, I was like, how much did this cost? And they're like, oh, not that much, like about, yeah, no, $10,000 or something. I'm like, why aren't we doing this everywhere? <laughs> so that was really encouraging. And I wish I could have put that in the book. But on the other hand, it gives me something to talk about. Yeah, that's true. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, if there was one law or policy that you could implement immediately or like a change to a law or policy, what would you choose? I would, if I could sort of wave a realistic magic wand and make something happen that's within the realm of possibility, I would put a price on carbon right away. Because the biggest problem we have is that the risks of producing heat trapping gas emissions are not being balanced against the benefits of burning fossil fuels. And I'm for looking at the costs and the risks together and making a decision based on what's best for a given person, city, state, country. But we can't do that if we don't have a price on carbon. So as I talk about in the book, I think putting a price on carbon would be the most effective thing to do. And if I could, if I could have a wish today, that's what I would do within the realm of possibility. Of course, if I could have a wish that was without the realm of possibility, I would just wish that we could get rid of all fossil fuels, that we could replace it immediately with clean energy and batteries, and that we could invest in nature-based solutions all around the world. But I think that would actually require magic, whereas I think a carbon price would not require magic.
Hello, my name is Carter. Um, I was wondering, you talk in your book a lot about like building relationships with people and finding ways that climate change affects things that they care about personally. So how do you balance that like longer process of building relationships with people with the fact that climate change is so severe and urgent? Well, that's a really good question because um, don't you wish that you could just go up and have a five minute conversation with somebody and they'd be like, sure, I need to do everything I can to help fix climate change. I wish we could do that. And in some cases, conversations can. But in some cases, it takes a while. And in some cases, we might not even see the fruits of the seeds that we've sowed. And I think about that a lot as, a, as an educator myself. And I'm sure your professors think about this too, because after you've, you've gone through their class, you might be remembering something they told you. You might even, that might even have changed your life, but often we don't go back and we don't tell people that. So if you have a chance to do that, do that <laughs> to help them see what a difference they've made. So the best we can do, and this is the way I think about it is, my responsibility is to do everything I can, but each person has free will. So it's not my responsibility to try to control somebody or force them into doing anything. It's only my responsibility to do whatever I can, which is sharing everything I know with people as much as I can, as best as I can. And then it's really up to them what they do with that information. How do we accelerate this though? How do we make it go faster? Well, part of that is like that experiment I talked about on social media. Part of it I do myself. I am always looking at how can I do things more effectively? How can I reach people in a different way? Um, Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, who's one of the uh, people who put together All We Can Save, which is this great compendium of women's voices on climate change, she has this great really um, simple diagram of overlapping circles. She says, what you should be doing is, first of all, what you're good at, good at different things, what's needed, and I love this one, what gives you joy? And right there in the middle of what you're good at, what's needed and what gives you joy, that's where you need to be. And I truly feel like if all of us are right where we need to be doing what we are good at, what the need is and what gives us joy, I feel like that's what really sort of almost like employing our superpowers. That's what gets that giant boulder rolling faster down the hill and really looking at how we can be effective and not beating our heads against a brick wall, not trying to spend years convincing the one person who's never gonna be convinced in our lives, but really looking strategically at where can I make a difference? And you know what? Maybe it's by talking with people where I work. Maybe it's the organization I'm part of. Maybe it's just renovating my house if you get to the point where you're owning a house and then showing everybody what you're doing and how much money you're saving. There's all kinds of different things we can do and being strategic about who we are, what's needed and what really makes us happy and brings us joy. I feel like that's the best we can ask for any of us, right? Uh, hi, my name is Paul Buckles. Um, and kind of going off that, magic wand question. I have a little bit different. Uh, if you could go back 150 years, per se, and change one thing in society or make a law or implement something, what would you implement or change just 150 years ago? Well, you wouldn't believe it, but I asked my students that same question. <laughs> <laughs> I just finished reading all their answers to it. It was really interesting. So I have thought about this. And my answer would be, I would, th there have been many places in our recent history where we had two pathways to choose from and we chose the fossil fuel pathway. Did you know that they invented the first electric car in the 1800s? <laughs> the electric car was competing with the internal combustion engine. <laughs> if I went back then, I'd be like, this is the one we want, this one, not that one. <laughs> and then here's a really shocking statistic. 70% of our carbon emissions, which you know is the main thing causing climate change, 70% of our carbon emissions were produced since the oil crisis in the 1970s. Mm. That's in one person's lifetime. I was born in the 1970s, just so you know. And that is my lifetime that 70% of our carbon emissions were produced. So if I could go back, not even that far, just at my own birth, um, I would be like, look, there's solar panels on the White House which there were in the 1970s. There's wind turbines in North Carolina, which there were in the 1970s. There's an oil crisis in the Middle East, which there was in the 1970s, and which frankly has continued again and again and again, coming back again and again. Now's the time to choose a different pathway. And if we had chosen that different pathway back in the 1970s, which is not that long ago, 
We'd be seeing a little bit of climate change, but we would be well on our way to a better future. And to be totally honest, I probably wouldn't even be a climate scientist. Thank you. Hi, my name's Allie. And um, on page 232, you talked about how you gave a sermon at um, one of the biggest churches in your area and then you connected Christian values to um, climate change. And so I was just wondering on like the response of the church, have you gotten a lot of backlash or have they been supportive to it? That's a great question. So the answer is it depends. <laughs> and the reason it depends is because in the United States, the number of people who identify as Christian for political reasons is growing very rapidly. It's gotten to the point now where in the US, 40% of the people who self-identify as evangelical Christian don't go to church. So where are they learning what they believe? They're not learning it from theology, from the Bible, from a pastor or a minister. They're learning it from Facebook, from news, from social media feeds not from Christian sources, but rather from political sources. So in the United States, I'm very sorry to say that a lot of people who call themselves Christians are really what I would call political Christians, where their statement of faith is written first by their political ideology and only a very different second, distant second by their theology. And if the two come into conflict, they'll go with politics over what the Bible says. So I do get a lot of pushback. In fact, I've estimated that probably about half of the, um, and when I say pushback, that's a euphemism for hate mail. <laughs> I would say half of the, half of the, why didn't you abort yourself, you whore of Jezebel type of stuff that I get, and those are all direct quotes. <laughs> About half of that comes from people who self-identify themselves as Christians. But when you look at what the Bible actually says, how are Christians supposed to be known? Jesus says Christians are supposed to be known by their love for others. So to me, that's not Christian behavior. That They're not attacking me because they're Christians. They're attacking me because they don't know what Christians are, because they see what I'm saying as representing a threat to their identity and to their ideology. So when I do get attacked by people who call themselves Christians, that's where I believe it's coming from. I don't think it's actually coming from their faith. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Eli. and. Kind of running along those same lines where you talk about like, you get a lot of uh, backlash, hate mail, and things like that. Um, I'm actually going into the pastoral ministry, so this is uh, super, super personal question because um, in, in your realm and, and where I'm going into, like we get a lot of people who just don't care, right? And you spend a lot of energy, a lot of time, uh, people who don't give a rip about anything you have to say. So uh, how do you how do you continue moving forward? How do you stay positive and find hope in the midst of, of all that that backlash? Well, that is a great question, and um, there's a really interesting article I would encourage you to read in The Atlantic. It came out a couple of weeks ago, and let me find the title of it for you because this is something really, really good. Um, it's called, uh, let's see, um, it's called The Evangelical Church is Breaking Apart, and it's by Peter Weiner, published in The Atlantic on October 24. So I would recommend reading it specifically because it says a lot of really important but sad things like he talked to hundreds of pastors around the United States and every single one of them told him that people were leaving their churches not because of any differences in theology but because of differences in political ideology because they thought the church should be speaking up more politically from from a specific perspective on the political spectrum to be very clear and when when you know when the leaders of the church were saying well no that's not what the bible says then people were leaving the church so we live in a really difficult time when um our understanding of um uh, of faith and belief is really become so intermingled with political ideology a journal that a journey that began a very long time ago that I feel like in, in many ways you're doing one of the most important things that you can possibly do, which is helping people sort of, um, in the book of James, it says, you're like somebody who looked in a mirror and then went away and forgot who you are. So I see what I do is holding up the mirror to people and saying, this is who you really are. 
And it's not just Christians, it's just people being decent and civil to each other and caring about other people and caring about the world around us and being good stewards. And, you know, those are tenets of, of pretty much every major world religion, as well as many people who don't identify with any particular religion. They still understand the value of civility, the value of caring for other people, the value of being good stewards of this incredible planet that we share with every other living thing that we know of in the universe. So holding up that mirror and just reminding people of who they are. And some people don't want to see themselves in the mirror and there's nothing you can do about that. But all you can do is just hold up that mirror and say, look, this is who you really are. Let's be who we are, not who society or politics or ideology or the media is trying to turn us into. That's really good, thank you. Hi, I'm Emma, and my question is, Has how have you seen COVID, like the COVID pandemic, like been a factor in climate change? Do you think it's helped our chances or hurt our chances? Or, yeah. Uh, well, I can tell you, I know the answer to that. <laughs> so um, during the lockdowns last, um, last spring, a year ago last spring, our carbon emissions dropped quite a bit. Um, they estimate up to about 17% in April and May when the big lockdowns were happening around the world. Overall, across 2020, they dropped 7% in total. But guess what happened? As soon as the lockdowns passed, they just shot right back up again and then some. And you know what's sort of the worst part about it? All of those, you know, COVID recovery plans, more of that money went to fossil fuels than clean energy which just invests us even further in fossil fuels and just delays climate action even further. So unfortunately, while there was a lot of hope and there was a lot of green recovery plans in some places, like um, in Canada, uh, companies couldn't get COVID recovery money from the government unless they had a climate plan. Um, big airlines like Air France and KLM were not allowed to get bailout money from the governments unless they had a carbon emission reduction plan. A lot of big cities realized that they didn't need to have so many cars in their center, and so they changed their whole pedestrian and public transportation systems after COVID. But overall around the world, it didn't make a difference. That's the bad thing. Here's the good thing. Even though more of the pandemic recovery money went to fossil fuels, clean energy is still growing. So last year around the world, 90% of new energy installed around the world was clean energy, even during the COVID pandemic. So the world is already changing. And if we were like that question, if we were back in the 1970s and the world was changing as quickly as it is today, I would feel pretty good about things. I really would. But it's just that we've had 40 years since then. And that's why we're in the problem that we're in today. And that's why things have to move quicker. And the, the reset button after the COVID pandemic was a really big chance to move things in the right direction. And I think in many cases, people just totally missed that button. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jenna. Um, my question for you is kind of whose responsibility is it? We kind of discussed in class whether the government should have more control on the policies or if it should be more on the individuals. So do you believe there's a responsibility on the government to enact this changing tra trajectory? And if so, did Trump's backing out of the Paris Agreement affect targets despite the smaller organizations stepping up and trying to enact the or tra change the tra trajectory? Yes. <laughs> Good question. Um, I think it's everybody's responsibility, but I also think that the more power we've been given, the greater our responsibility if that makes sense. So, I mean, let's just look at personal carbon emissions. Look at people who live in some of the poorest areas in the world that produce almost no carbon emissions. Their responsibility is, you know, this big. Then let's look at the CEO of the biggest multinational oil and gas corporation in the world. Their responsibility is, you know, this big, right? So I think that the responsibility varies by the power that we have to affect change and to make a difference. And the federal governments definitely have responsibility. There's no question about that because they enact federal policies. And often we want to do the right thing, but we might lack the resources or the ability to do so unless policy is enacted that enables us to do so. Like for example, fossil fuels are heavily subsidized much more than clean energy. 
-hmm. And so that makes fossil fuels artificially cheaper for people and clean energy artificially more expensive. You need the government to fix that. But on the other hand, there's so many poli effective policies that can and should and are being, being enacted by cities, by states, by companies. Big companies like Microsoft and Apple and Google and small companies too. Then schools and universities and seminaries and um, neighborhoods can make changes. So there's really, we can make these changes at every scale and we have responsibility to change what we can which for all of us is not just our carbon footprint, so to speak, but it's a word that I didn't happen upon until after I finished writing the book. And so I would also add this to the book if I had a chance, as per the earlier question. It's not just about our carbon footprint, it's about our climate shadow. It's about the way that we affect and interact with other people. And today in the internet era, all of us have tremendous reach. I mean, look at how people can reach each other on social media. You can reach people on the other side of the world with what you put on social media or share. Look at how the, the young people's climate strikes have reached people around the world. There's really effective ways to change the world and it begins with using our voice like I talk about in the book. So under the Trump administration, they pulled out of the Paris Agreement, but cities, states, corporations, um, universities and more and tribal nations representing over 50% of US emissions were still in. So like the, the city of Houston um, is, was still in on the Paris Agreement. Uh, many different states were still in. So progress was still being made. But what, what did the US pulling out do? Well, it sent basically a signal to the rest of the world that said, I don't care and we don't care. Mm -hmm. Sure, we in the US, the US as a country is responsible for almost 30% of all cumulative carbon emissions since the dawn of the industrial era, 30% from one country. The next closest country is China, they're at 12%. So imagine the biggest emitter basically saying, I don't care. That sends some really big shockwaves around the world. And it really discourages other people from taking action. It's like, um, you know, imagine if you went out for dinner with 100 people and some people couldn't afford anything more than a glass of water because they had had literally nothing. Some people ate, you know, a single egg roll because <laughs> that's all they could afford. And then imagine one person sat down and ordered and ate a six course meal, including lobster, three steaks and two bottles of wine. And then they walked out of the restaurant and said, I'm not paying. Like that was sort of the effect of the US saying we're not part of the Paris Agreement. And it's just an abnegation of responsibility, which the U.S., as a very powerful country, has that responsibility to fulfill. Thank you. No, please, I'm just plugging in the PowerPoint. It's a pump fake, it's a pump fake question. Gabe's coming. Hi, I'm Gabe. Um, a little smaller scale question, but what are some of the best and most practical ways ways college students can help to reduce climate change? Oh, well, you know my first answer, right? Which is using your voice to talk about it, yeah. <laughs> obviously. Um, but you can do things in your personal life as well. And so what I encourage my students to do is I say, here's a personal carbon footprint calculator, sort of step on the carbon scales and look at where your emissions come from. And it might come from a very different place than you think. And try something out and see what difference it makes in your life but then of course, whatever you do, talk about it. Also join an organization that shares your values. There are all kinds of organizations and I talk about them in the book, right? I mean, there is Young Evangelicals for Climate Action. There is the Sunrise Movement. There is 350.org. There are organizations for moms and dads and parents and senior citizens, for people who love hiking and birding and kayaking and skiing, for people who, whoever you are, join an organization and plug in with them, connect with them, and help use your voice to advocate for the changes that we need. And I know that you're probably pretty good at that. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, my name is Layla. Um, so on page 211, you mentioned the issue regarding recycling, which I've kind of heard a little bit before where you said much of it just ends up in the dump. Um, which is kind of frustrating. I know you mentioned using your university housing department's homegrown program that was put together by um, Melanie Tatum. I was just wondering if you've helped any more with that to kind of get the program to flourish, or if not, if you've looked into other ways and or have been acting on 
um, fixing this issue with recycling and not to add to the questions about how could we also be a part of that. Well, that's another place where I think using our voice can really help. So um, some places have great recycling programs already. The city does it or the state does it, and that's fantastic. Where I live, though, our city does a little bit of it, but I didn't say this in the book because I didn't want to be too offensive. But the reality is one of our graduate students was curious because the city says it recycles a bunch of stuff, but you don't know where it's going. So she actually sat there beside the 15 different dumpsters because you have to sort things into clear plastic, translucent plastic, opaque plastic, aluminum, tin, glass, clear glass, tinted glass. You have to sort things into every type of category you can imagine. And she's like, wow, that's a lot of sorting. Where do all those things go? So she sat there and she followed the trucks as they took these giant bins to see, well, where does the opaque plastic go as opposed to the clear plastic? And you know where the trucks went? Same place. <laughs> Not just the same place. They went to the garbage dump. <laughs> I was appalled and I was livid because how much of my precious time, I mean, and our time is the most non-renewable resource we have, right? How much of my time had I spent sorting it into those categories? Oh, I was so angry. So um, I did not take my revenge by calling the city out in the book. <laughs> I just was very gentle the way I mentioned that. But our, our, um, our university program was amazing. And it wasn't even started by the university. It was started by a single woman. So during COVID, she just didn't have the students to keep on running it because, you know, all the situation with COVID and classes and remote learning. So since then, she's talking to the university, and I completely support her in this, about the university actually doing it because the university, I think, has a responsibility to be good stewards of their resources. It shouldn't be on one woman in the housing department to run the recycling program for the whole city, which essentially is what she does. I think the university needs to step up. And how do we get the university to step up? It's especially when students, faculty, yes, but the thing is, here's the difference. And if you don't know this, this is really important. <laughs> the university pays us money. So what we think is not as important to them as what you think because you pay the university money. See what I mean? <laughs> That's why I always encourage my students to speak up to the university because the university understands that students have a choice. They can pick different places. And if they pick this university or if they want more students to pick it in the future, it has to be an attractive place for students to be. And increasingly, you guys are smart. You understand that universities need to be leading the way, being efficient with their energy, clean, uh, using clean energy, recycling. You understand that and using your voices is a way to affect change very powerfully. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Priscilla. And I was just wondering what like, the hardest part of the book was to write and like if there was a chapter of the book that was like harder to write than the others. Yes, <laughs> there definitely was. The chapters on fear and guilt. I ripped those things apart multiple times, completely rewrote them, throw most of it in the garbage, I had to go talk to some researchers who study fear and actually try to understand the experiments they've done with people's brains on how we respond to fear, get them to read what I wrote, get some really hard critiques, rip it apart again and rewrite it. Those were so hard because we often just want black and white. Like, does fear work, yes or no? And as you know from the book, the answer is it depends. It works if we know what to do with it, but it doesn't work if we don't. And that sounds like a really simple answer, but I had to read so many studies. I had to talk to so many people to really distill it into that's when fear works. It wakes us up and we need to be awoken, right? We need to understand there's a problem because if there isn't a problem, why would you want to fix it? But once we know there's a problem, we need to know what to do about it. So if we don't pair the, the, the awareness of the risks, if we don't immediately pair it with positive constructive solutions, it paralyzes us and it makes us just switch off. So that was the hardest part of the book for me to write. Mm -hmm. No, no, please. Uh, before Anthony uh, asks his question, Wendy and Michelle, uh, when he's work, if when he's done with his question, if one of you want to jump in with a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and do so. Um, and Wendy or uh, Michelle, thank you for putting that Atlantic link uh, in the chat. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Uh, as Dr. Bolton said, uh, I'm Anthony. Um, so my question is um, understanding that the majority of rare earth minerals come from mainland China or Chinese-owned mines in Africa. So how do you how do you respond? Um, and understand that these the minerals are are ones required for um, alternative energy, whether it's solar panels or um, batteries or whatnot. 
how do you uh, how do you um, respond with um, countries like the U.S. becoming dependent upon um, well for the U.S. our greatest uh, enemy, um, China as well, and obviously the, the Chinese Communist Party, um, and how, how for further uh, production of batteries and um, rare minerals that would be required um, for alternative energy. Yes, so so that relates a little bit to the first question, but slightly different. Well, so first of all, the U.S. relying on other countries is nothing new. If you look at who holds the largest oil reserves in the world, it is a list of the, the countries you would least want to have the U.S. over a barrel to, so to speak. Pardon the pun. So depending on other countries for energy security is nothing new. The U.S. has been doing it for decades, and it has led the United States into full-out wars and cost the U.S. trillions of dollars. So I think it's time to think ahead proactively and end that. Um, and part of that is through reducing and eventually eliminating dependence on fossil fuels. Part of that is through figuring out, like the National Renewable Energy Lab is doing in Colorado, figuring out how to recycle minerals. And part of it is figuring out, which people are doing every day, working on making batteries that don't require cobalt, which only comes from one place in Africa, or that don't require lithium, which does come from a few places around the world, but there's not a lot of it. We need to figure out how to do things better and faster. And that's something that the U.S. has been very successful in in the past when it mobilized the resources to do so. So right now, the research is basically a little bit of federal research and then mostly just academic research with whatever grants they can cobble together. But if the U.S. announced a sort of like a moonshot, like, you know, like when JFK said, we're going to the moon, if they did that type of thing for batteries, we're going to rare earth free uh, uh, batter, uh, batteries, and they really put a lot behind it, they could get there. It's possible. And I think that we really need to understand how clean energy is a route to energy independence, but it's also a route to better international security, cleaner air and water, more affordable energy, better jobs, there's already more jobs in solar than there is in coal across the whole country, far more jobs. It really is the future. And the faster we get there, the better off we'll be. Right now, I would add to what you said, right now, China has way more, has invested way more in solar and wind technology than the US. And so the US is already lagging behind technologically. And so that's a challenge. And that's a challenge that I think can be met, but only if they decide to do so. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Alana. Hey, Alana, oh. can you give, uh, I think, what he's going to Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. oh, no, 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 no. I'd rather everyone of the group there say right. what they would like to ask, and then if there's time left, I'll ask something. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't really know how to word this because this is a more recent question that I came up with, but I, I like to have conversations about climate change and environmental policy and stuff with like just the people around me, it's really interesting. Um, my family doesn't really like to talk about that. And whenever it comes up, my dad gets very dismissive. So the last time I was talking to him about it, he said, he got really upset and he said, it's not about the environment, it's about political control. And I was curious to know how you would respond to that because um, I didn't know what to say in the moment. Yes. Well, I, I would actually half agree with him. Okay. Um, it isn't about saving the planet. Mm -hmm. The planet is going to be orbiting the sun long after we're gone. And if you look at things from the perspective of the planet rather than us humans, it might be better off without us. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think that because I'm a human. I would like to remain <laughs> on planet Earth. So just to be totally clear on that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, it really isn't about the environment. It is about us. We cannot float around in outer space without the resources this planet provides. The economy cannot float around in outer space without the resources this planet provides. The United States government cannot float around in outer space without this planet and its resources. It really, again, it's not about saving the planet, it's about saving us. And I would say, when he says it's about political control, I would say, you're right, it is about political control. Did you know that 20 years ago, nobody disagreed over facts about science that we've known since the 1800s? 20 years ago in the 1990s, Republicans and Democrats were both like, oh, sure, global warming, yeah, it's real. Same numbers. What happened since then? 
people were politically brainwashed by the richest corporations in the world to believe that we don't need climate action so they could keep on earning trillions of dollars every quarter. That it is about political control. I actually 100% agree with him on that, but it's not the political control he thinks. So I would sort of turn it around on him because surprising people is always kind of fun. And I would say, you know what, dad? I learned it is about political control. And there's this great movie we should watch together called Merchants of Doubt. It's about how they hire spin doctors to totally twist things and convince us that we don't know what science is saying. And Merchants of Doubt is a really great movie to watch. It's actually kind of horrifying, but it's all about how, yes, it is indeed about political control, just not the way he might think. Oh, thank you. <laughs> when you can agree with someone when they don't think that you're gonna agree with them, that's always a really good technique. <laughs> So what's an opinion of yours about climate change that causes you to get the most opposition? Uh, well, most, uh, um, I would say the main opinion is that we need to do something about it. Uh, because all of the objections we hear, all of the sciencey sounding objections, all of the religiously sounding objections, all of the political sounding objections that we hear, every single one of those objections is just a smokescreen for the real issue, which is I don't want to fix it. So I think that just standing up and saying anything that implies that we need to fix it is what gets me most of the flack because that I get attacked by people who don't want to fix it. That's it in a nutshell. So that's very sad. Um, okay, is there anybody else in the class or should we go to Wendy and Michelle now? Anybody else who hasn't had a chance to come up and ask? Oh, come on up. One more. Okay, excellent. Okay, uh, there are things being done for like cleaner energy and such. But are there new like viable alternatives to things like plastic bottles and other non-biodegradable products of fossil fuels? And if there aren't yet, when would they become viable? Yes, there are. Um, so I was just talking with um, Nestle a little while ago. They're the ones, they do water bottles, right? In addition to chocolate bars and all other things. And they have already reduced the plastic packaging on Nestle water bottles, which answers my question why the caps are so small. <laughs> it's because they reduced their plastic. I think they've cut it by 50% compared to other water bottles, which is pretty cool. But they understand that cutting it is good, but getting rid of it is better. So they're working on biodegradable plastic that's made of vegetable oils rather than petroleum which is very cool. And obviously every single one of us can do our part by just having our own water bottle so we don't need to buy them too. Uh, there's all kinds of really interesting technologies where they're trying to um, develop uh, carbon neutral jet fuel. And there's one airline that buys more sustainable jet fuel than any other, all the other airlines in the whole world put together. I bet you don't know who that is. I wouldn't have guessed either. It's United Airlines. They buy more sustainable jet fuel than all the other airlines in the world put together. And that just made me feel like writing to American Airlines and Southwest and be like, people, what are you doing? <laughs> Why aren't you doing this too? And I think I will actually do that. Maybe you should too, or whatever airline you use. <laughs> so then there's some things where we just don't need plastic. We just, you got used to plastic, and we don't need it. So as I write about in the book, every year I add two new good habits to my life. And last year it was getting rid of plastic with shampoo bottles and soap in the bathroom using bars instead. And we got a bunch of different shampoo bars and my family all tried them out and voted on which ones they liked the best. It was actually kind of fun. Um, and then this year, in Jan starting in January, I'm actually eliminating plastic from the kitchen and the laundry room. I mean, you can use like these, these sheets or you can use these what they call drops that come in biodegradable vegetable based plastic to, to wash the dishes and to wash your clothes. So I'm doing that. So there's things that we can do where we don't have to use plastic anymore. And one of those things is taking our bags to the grocery store, right? Instead of using plastic bags, very simple things that, you know what? Our grandparents used to do. That's the way they lived. And somehow we just sort of went in this completely other direction. And then we're like, oh my gosh, they really didn't know what they were doing. <laughs> We can go back to the way they used to live. But there's also a lot of new technologies that we can develop where we can make things in ways that are sustainable, that break down or that recycle or that don't produce waste. And we can look for those things and buy them. And they're available today in a way that they were not 20 years ago. And that's pretty cool. Thank you. Wendy and Michelle, all of our students have went through and asked one question. They each have more, but before I give them a second chance, like Sam already cut in, 
good question, second question. Um, do either of you want to jump in with a question you've had for Dr. Hale? Please do. Well, first of all, I want to thank you, um, Catherine and the class and um, your school for allowing us to sort of piggyback in on this um, wonderful session today. Uh, Michelle and I are both from Bellevue College in Washington State, so we're a long way away from you. Um, I'm actually an emeritus faculty. Michelle is um, one of the librarians at our school. And we both just finished reading your book and discussing it last Friday, Catherine. It was our selection for this quarter's faculty climate justice book group that we have every quarter. And we just finished our discussion Friday. So this is, this is great. And I'm sorry more people couldn't be here. Most of the instructors are just super busy right now with the end of the quarter. But I wanted to ask Michelle if she wanted to ask anything first. I, I have something I would say, but I wanted to ask Michelle. Okay, I will just say something quickly. Now, I had to look it up, but Spring Arbor is in Michigan. Is that right? Right. Yeah. yeah, I'm from Ann Arbor, so Yay. long way from home. I, I don't have a question. I just have a comment and I'm really, I just want to say I'm really heartened to hear all of the questions from you young people. I have teenagers and they give me hope for the future and you guys do too. So thank you for thinking about all of, thinking about our planet. So no questions. Uh, go ahead, Wendy. Uh, that's lovely. Thank you so much, Michelle. That is. Thanks, Michelle. Mm -hmm. it, okay, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Catherine, you, you talk a lot, you know, the whole book really and, and your approach of meeting people where they're at, the things that they love, they care about, what are they already concerned about or what do they just like to do, what are their hobbies, and having that like a pathway into conversation. Um, and then kind of taking it from there. And actually the emeritus group that I, small emeritus group I'm, I am a part of, and we're, we're forming because we want to work only on the climate uh, crisis and climate justice issue and work within our college, hopefully. Um, we're actually designing some sessions that would take that approach. And the whole idea is to do outreach to the community around the college around our Earth Week. We've been celebrating Earth Week for over 20 years now and a whole week worth of sessions. So we're hoping to uh, plug in and do some of these um, kind of almost, you know, teach at the same time, like, you know, why is the science around skiing? I mean, what's happening? You know, the climate science around skiing. Why is this an issue? How is it gonna affect you? And then end up with the positive solutions, you know, your kind of three-step process. I'm designing one for people who love animals and wildlife. That's perfect. <laughs> yeah. So we're trying to pick out a number of just really things that every, you know, people love, you know, climate, uh, how climate affects foodies or people who like to eat or, you know, um, that kind of thing. Beer and wine. <laughs> beer and wine. Absolutely. For beer and wine. Um, and also hopefully bring some community members onto the campus if we have it in person or at least by Zoom and we're really trying to do that outreach. So having said all that, I tuned into your session with Village Books in Bellingham in early October. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you did with the, the fellow that was interviewing you. Forrest Inslee. Yes was a of, really of awesome Jay, really. <laughs> little interview, not an interview, but like you modeled how you can do one of those conversations. Oh yes, I did that with him. So, so sort of like an inventory of your identity, like what points of connection you can make with people. And I didn't tell him about it ahead of time. It just sort of occurred to me. So I still remember the look in his eyes. It was like deer in the headlights, what? <laughs> yeah. But he did a great job. And I he think did. all of us can do that. Yes. And you know, I found that really helpful. Mm -hmm. In the sense of if you're, if we're all going to really kind of try to get out of our, whatever it is that we feel about doing this and start those conversations with people, um, this is such a good, this is such a good approach, but we, we maybe need a little, some tools or some encouragement 
on how to actually do it. And I don't know if you'd be willing, there may not be time and I don't wanna take up the time of other people, but um, I for one would love to see that done again because <laughs> it was so helpful. Mm -hmm. So if perhaps at the end of the session and people are done asking their questions, there's time and people are interested, maybe, maybe we could fit that in today. Oh, uh, well, I absolutely love that. So what I'm thinking is, let's do this. Um, let's go with um, a few more second questions. We have until the top of the hour. Is that right, Rob? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's do a few more second, uh, second questions for people. And then with, with a few minutes left, what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave you with an activity. Okay. which is what Wendy just discussed. I'm going to model with you how I would do my personal inventory, sort of going through my life and thinking of ways that I could connect with people. And then I'm gonna challenge you to do yours and write down at least three things, bonus points if you can get five things, at least three things that you care about that are central to who you are, to what you care about, to your identity, to who, what, where you love, and then turn to the person beside them and share them with them as the activity before you leave. Okay, good. Okay, so so we're gonna do that and I think that's gonna be great. And then what's the next step after you do that? The next step then is to find out how that connects to climate change. Like say something that you care about is ice fishing. Okay, just as an example. I'm from Ontario, so lots of ice fishing in Ontario as well as, as Michigan. So if I care about ice fishing, then what I would do, and thanks to Google, you can do this in half an hour or less, I would just find out about, okay, so what does the ice fishing season in Michigan look like? Oh, it's two weeks shorter now than it was 10 years ago. It's four weeks shorter than it was eight, you know, 12 years ago. Um, you know, find out some statistics about how the outdoor hockey season or the ice fishing season is already changing so that when that comes up in conversation, which it will because it's something that you're passionate about and other people enjoy too, you'll have that information at your fingertips to bring up. Does that make sense? Okay, I see a few nods. All right, I'm gonna repeat that again when I do my inventory, but let's go to second round of questions here. Let's have a few second questions. All right, we don't have enough time to get through everyone, but who wants, who wants to ask a question? Allie was telling me some people work class during to ask a question. So who's that? Do you have another question, Allie, what you ask Paul? A uh, question that you think is different than anybody else asked, because we've had so many good questions, but there's still more questions to ask. So if you've yeah, had your questions. And we, have, we, we do have a, a wide group, a wide range of uh, opinions here in our class. We took a sassy quiz at the beginning of the semester. So some are, we're all at very different places along that spectrum. So uh -huh. good. is that, that out there? Anyone want to ask that a little bit tonight? Oh, All right. Hi. So, yeah. Um, say, your, say your name again. Yeah, I'm Anthony. Uh, so, uh, so yeah. So, my question is: seeing uh, seeing that alternative energy has never been successful with pri providing enough power to run a city, much less a country. Um, with France and Germany as examples of which had to suspend their um alternative energy programs. Um, because they were not able to produce enough energy and were forced to buy um, energy from other countries. Um, why do you still think that alternative energy is a viable solution without completely destroying our infrastructures, mainly our larger cities? Um, so first of all, um, your question has a straw man in it. A straw man is where you say something that isn't true and then you ask somebody why it's true. <laughs> So the, the, the straw man is that they didn't suspend their renewable energy programs. They still have plenty of, of renewable energy. In fact, they're suspending their natural gas pipeline from Russia is what they're actually suspending. So the reality is, is um, sort of remember I talked earlier about how there's this idea that there's got to be like perfectly cheap energy or else we just use what we have. It's the idea that we, we can just sort of the fallacy that we can just sort of snap our fingers overnight and just transition like immediately from party line telephones to cell phones. The transition from party line telephones to single line telephones to mobile phones to cell phones, it took a while. And there was two steps forward and one step back and two steps forward and one step back. That's just the way new technology goes. Mm -hmm. What's happening here is we're trying to push that new technology forward even faster. Why? Because burning fossil fuels produces so much air pollution that it prematurely kills 10 million people a year. That's double the number of COVID every single year. That's a pretty hefty price to pay. So again, I'm all in favor of looking at the balance. Look at the balance of what fossil fuels really costs us, but look at the balance of what they really benefit us, which they do, 
and put those together and then make decisions about how much clean energy you're going to be using where, when, and how. And when we do that, in some places like Germany, it might already average out. In other places like where I live in Texas, I know that the balance would swing even more in favor of clean energy. We already have 23% clean energy in Texas, which is pretty amazing for the state of Texas. And it would go even farther in that direction if we had a price in carbon or if we're actually considering the fact that climate change took a $75 billion bite out of the Texas economy when, with, through Hurricane Harvey alone, for example. So all technology requires, again, like I said, two steps forward, one step back. I don't know any technology that didn't. They didn't go to the moon the first time they tried. There were accidents, very, very sad accidents in the space program, but they kept on trying because they knew it was worth it. And that's what we have to do here as well. And we have to learn from our mistakes. And there definitely were mistakes made and we can learn from them. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Eli. Okay, so yeah, uh, this is kind of a, my name is Eli again. Uh, this is more of a, a general question, but it can also be uh, applied to climate change as well. Because um, we have this interesting dynamic where, where people know that climate change is a problem, and we've talked about that how in the past people knew it was a problem and they just didn't want to change. So I'm just curious as to what you think, um, because in all other realms of society and life, people are very resistant to change. Uh, what do you think are the biggest reasons uh, for that? Well, um, one of the reasons is just that we are resistant to change. We always, as humans, our brains are wired to sort of prefer what we already have than what could come in the future. So when do we change? It's when we know there's something better. So to give you an example, when the brand new iPhone comes out, are people told they really should get it? It's better. They really, I mean, they probably don't want to get it, but they really should. No, people are lining up to get that thing, right? When there's a new piece of technology coming out that we know is going to be better than what we have now, people are lining up to get it. So that's part of what we need to do is show people the benefits of some of these new technologies or just the fact that old fashioned efficiency saves us a ton of money as individuals, as households, and as cities and states in a country. Um, we need to show what the benefits are of change and also what the drawbacks are of the current status quo because I would bet before you guys read my book you probably had no idea that 10 million people die from air pollution every year from burning fossil fuels and if we don't even know these things then why would we ever want to change so we really have to understand the risks much more clearly we have to understand the benefits much more clearly and we do have to understand the costs of change as well clearly because there are costs cost is not change is not free but we need a holistic perspective on the whole thing, not a very tiny, narrow perspective, which unfortunately I think is what we have today. Thank you very much. Yes. I think we maybe one more from our class here. Okay, and then we'll do that activity I talked about. One Great. More. Okay, thank you, Jen. I was gonna call on Dr. Chris a minute ago. <laughs> Um, so you touched on in the book of how education in the poorer countries with the less resources would help decrease the death rates in women and children. Um, so if they have this uh, limited amount of resources, and since we are like so far away, or we are so disassociated from them, how do we provide that education without the, without having that contact and that availability of resources ourselves. Well, personal, speaking personally for myself, that's why I donate to the organizations that I do. There are really good organizations, um, you know, like World Vision or like Tier Fund. Then there's organizations like Solar Sister that I talk about in the book. Organizations that specifically work in some of the poorest countries in the world that invest in people. It's the whole idea of, you know, give a man a fish, you'll feed him for a day, teach a man how to fish. He'll be able to feed himself for the rest of his life. That's really what we need to be doing. And there's tons of great organizations who are doing it. And so just even, you know, something as simple as finding a few of them, following them on social media, share their posts so people know, other people know what they're doing. Spread the word. If you don't, if you're not able to support them financially, you can still support them by spreading the news of what they're doing, which also gives us hope because we understand that we can really make a difference in the world in real people's lives today that have benefits immediately for their well-being. And oh, they have benefits as well for all of us tomorrow. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Okay, this is the last activity. So I'm going to lay this activity out for you that I'm going to go eat my dinner while you finish it up. Here's how we're doing it. I have had 
thousands of conversations with people about climate change. And I'm absolutely convinced that just about everybody has a reason they already, that already has a reason, I should say, to care about climate change. And if they don't think they care, they just haven't connected the dots between that reason and how climate change affects it. So how do you start to connect with other people who might have the same reasons you do? Um, and, you know, you might not be able to connect with some people because some people, they just, you know, we don't share that much in common and I could understand what they care about, but it's not what I care about. That's okay. Other people can have conversations with them. You don't have to have a conversation with the whole world, just with the people who share things with you. So that's where the inventory comes in. Okay. So the inventory consists of who you love, what you love, and where you love. Okay. So who do I love? Well, first of all, I love my family who lives in Canada. I love my son. I'm a mother. I would do anything I could to ensure he has a better future. And that's a big part of why I care. So I can talk to other moms. And in fact, I often do talk to other moms about why climate change matters to our kids and how, you know, when the wildfire smoke is in the air, you can't let your kids out to play in the Western US. And even this summer, you know, we had wildfire smoke all the way across to Southern Ontario and across Michigan. You could smell it in the air. We're, and this affects, especially it affects kids if they have asthma. Anyways, there's all kinds of ways we can connect the dots. Okay, so what about where I love? Where, well, I live in Texas and Texas is very vulnerable to climate impacts. And so I you know do a little bit of research, which you can do too, to find out what's happening where you live, what's happening in Michigan. The lake ice season is getting shorter. Invasive species are moving in. It's affecting the fruit crops that are all around that part of Michigan. It's affecting all of the, the native plants and animals in the nature. It's affecting the Great Lakes. It's leading to buildup of these terrible algae blooms in, in some of the Great Lakes. You can find out what's happening in the places where you live. Then what about the things that you love? Well, I love skiing, which requires snow. Um, I grew up with a skating rink in our backyard and my goodness, there is no skating rink in the backyard these days. Winters are way too warm for that. Um, I, um, I love, um, I do love food. And so I definitely talk to people about that. In the book, I tell a story about how I love knitting and I've connected with people over knitting and the idea that you could, you know, knit the warming stripes or you could get a warming stripes mask or you get warming stripes flip flops or you get warming stripes leggings or you get a warming stripes t-shirt and you can just wear it around and people are like, what's that? And you're like, oh, so glad you asked. Let me explain. So there's all kinds of ways that you can start conversations and the warming stripes is a really easy one to do. But probably most profoundly for me is my faith. I'm a Christian. And in fact, the reason I'm a climate scientist is because I'm a Christian. I was planning to be an astrophysicist. And I, in fact, that's what my undergraduate degree is in. That's what my first five research papers are in. The reason why I became a climate scientist is because I found out how profoundly unfair climate change is, how it affects the very poorest and most vulnerable people right here in North America and downtown Detroit, as well as in sub-Saharan Africa, it affects the very people who've done the least to contribute to the problem. And that is not fair. How can we love the least of these, as it says in the Bible, if we don't care for them and provide for their physical needs? As um, St. Francis of Assisi said, he said, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. So that's really, I think, the way that we show love to others is not just what we say, but what we do as well. And so for me, becoming a climate scientist was an act of love. For those who don't have a voice, who don't have the ability to study this issue, who don't have the ability to, you know, attend a university, get a higher education, um, use their talents to call for change. And I do what I can because I know that it affects real people today. And I know that we have three choices. We can cut our carbon emissions, we can prepare for the impacts we can no longer avoid, or we can suffer. And my goal is to reduce the suffering as much as possible. So whoever you are, you have things you care about. You have people you care about. I have one colleague who hunts. So he talks to other hunters about how they want to make sure there's healthy ecosystems so they can continue to hunt responsibly. Um, I have colleagues who are farmers who talk to other farmers about how you can put carbon back in the soil where we want it, where it's a fertilizer instead of the atmosphere where we don't. There's so many things that we can ha talk about. So I'm going to challenge you now to write down at least three things. Think about again, who you love, where you love and what you love. And then I want you to turn to the person beside you and share those with you. And Rob, if you can tell people to do that once you feel like people have, have written down their three things. And then what I want to challenge you to do this week is just spend a bit of time Googling what's the relationship between what you love 
and how climate change is affecting it. I just read an article yesterday about golf and climate change. This article is about tennis and climate change, about running and climate change, about baseball and climate change, about football and climate change. Whatever it is you love, beach vacations and climate change. There's something to do with it. So spend the time, find out a couple little facts about how what you care about is being affected by climate change. And next time you have a conversation with somebody who shares that with you, you'll be ready to share why climate change matters to you and why it matters to them too. Thank you so much for having me. This has been so much fun. Your questions have been fantastic. Thank you. We've appreciated your time, Dr. Hayhoe. Thank you. Bye-bye.